The Arab oil embargo in 73 and then the second oil shock in 79 made it absolutely clear that we had to get off oil. So the result was uh, growing oil shortages in the United States. We were extremely import dependent, particularly from the Middle East, the Persian Gulf. Uh, and uh, there started to be lines at filling stations. Uh, we never experienced a gasoline shortage. We never experienced huge price hikes. The price of, of oil shot up uh, have, after a half century of stability. I think Americans had never realized before that our import dependence had consequences. It was like kicking an anthill. The, uh, the, the national mood was suddenly upended. Things halfway around the world that we hadn't been paying much attention to suddenly had a very direct uh, inconveniencing effect on our way of life. And we started to think, uh, gee, we're vulnerable in ways we never realized we were. We'd better do something about it. So a lot of stupid things were proposed, and indeed, many of them were tried. They didn't work very well. But meanwhile, efficiency won the day. In the eight years starting 1977, uh, the U.S. economy grew 27 percent, but our oil use fell 17 percent, our oil imports fell by half, and our imports from the Persian Gulf fell by 87 percent. If we kept that up one more year, we would no longer have needed any oil from the Persian Gulf. President Reagan then came in and reversed the policy, uh, and our imports started going up again. But uh, the, mainly through seven and a half miles a gallon better domestic cars, uh, we really uh, broke the back of the embargo. The irony was that efficiency worked so well, uh, including increasing the fuel economy of our cars by 62% in a decade while they got safer, peppier, and cleaner. Uh, it worked so well that, that by 85, 86, it crashed the oil price whereupon started what you might call the years of the locusts of Eden. Uh, for at least a decade, our government paid almost no attention to energy. Uh, most of the efficiency and renewables programs that had been starting quite a good golden age uh, were canceled for both ideological reasons and lack of political attention. Uh, and the time we could have been consolidating those post embargo gains and making this permanently a non-problem, uh, that time was all wasted. Even today, uh, we spend $2 billion a day in America buying oil and $4 billion a day through our taxes uh, for the hidden economic and military costs of oil dependence, not counting any effects on health, safety, environment, climate, uh, Oil, oil burning is the biggest carbon emitter, even bigger than coal, uh, or global stability, global development, or our nation's independence and reputation. So <clears throat> as I focused on those costs, which were by then very <laughs> manifest, uh, I, I realized that oil was really only half or less of the problem. It became clear that uh, my life's work ought to be in solving these problems because it was pretty clear that there was so much scope in energy efficiency uh, and so much promise in renewables that we could probably displace the fossil fuels and indeed nuclear energy. Um, it also was clear that, that energy was just one of a nest or a tangle of problems around population, resources, environment, uh, development, security, economy, and that energy was kind of a master key that could unlock most of those problems and tell us how to think about the others, like water, which has many differences but even more important parallels. So <clears throat> it seemed that focusing mainly on energy while keeping an eye on all of the linkages uh, would be a very powerful way uh, to turn these uh, problems into opportunities, and that's how it's turned out. Because as Bucky Fuller said, you, you don't just do a, a frontal assault on, on the established order, you invent a new model that works better and makes the old order obsolete. That's how you get big change. Carmi was founded in 82 during the Reagan administration, and there were still very uh, 
unsound, unsustainable trends operating in all the sectors that use energy, transportation, buildings, industry, and electricity. Uh, so we started working in equal depth in all of those sectors. RMI is particularly noted for grand syntheses that pull a whole field together, sometimes a field that didn't even exist before. The latest in this series of, of grand syntheses is Reinventing Fire, Bold Business Solutions for the New Energy Era. It's probably the most important thing we've done yet, and it, it shows how to run a 2.6-fold bigger U.S. economy in 2050 with no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, a third less natural gas, 80-odd percent lower carbon emissions, $5 trillion lower cost, uh, no new inventions, no act of Congress, the transition led by business for profit. Most people don't realize how quickly some other countries are driving this revolution in Asia and in Europe, particularly, while in America many of us stand on the platform arguing and the train's already left the station. So, so yes, there is a lot of good state and local and private sector leadership in this country, but we have a paralyzed Congress, uh, and that's why at Rocky Mountain Institute we've never assumed the solution lay in, uh, in the legislature, but rather if we could mobilize the dynamism of the private sector in its coevolution with civil society, sped by military innovation, then we could use these highly effective institutions to go around our ineffective institutions. Now that we passed 400 parts per million carbon, a symbolic threshold on the way to a very bad place where you wouldn't want to live in, we have uh, a greater sense of urgency. We have not only uh, the uh, instability and expense and risk of oil, but also the climate imperative. Uh, we have concerns about the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, about global instability, uh, the faltering of global development in some places, uh, the uh, reputational damage that our country has inflicted on itself. Our job is playing our unique role in catalyzing the greatest infrastructure shift in the history of our species.